start with a short introduction, then we'll get to our speaker. Uh, I'm Anthony Carpey. I'm currently serving as interim dean of research at the college. This is one of uh, the book events sponsored through the Office for the Advancement of Research at John Jay. And these are a series of lectures um, over the course of the academic year by authors, some internal to John Jay, some external to John Jay, but writing about issues that we think are especially pertinent to the mission of the college. Um, we ask them to come here and talk about their, their books and share some of their work with us. And this month, I'm really pleased that we have with us Dr. Eric Mannheimer, um, who will be talking about his book, 12 Patients, Life and Death at Bellevue Hospital. Um, Eric Mannheimer is an MD. He's an internist and served as the medical director at Bellevue Hospital from 1997 to 2012. He's currently a clinical professor at the New York University School of Medicine. He's had a long interest in international health and has worked in places such as Haiti, Pakistan, um, and Latin America in medical anthropology, history, social sciences, animal literature. His book focuses on his time at Bellevue Hospital and talks about the social, political, and economic issues facing the country as told through a series of 12 very different patients at Bellevue Hospital. The book offers an unflinching glimpse into the lives of the sick while indicting the cultural, social, and institutional forces that have contributed to their conditions. Just a couple of excerpts from some um, reviews of the book that I want to read from one reviewer. This book is not only brilliant, it's deeply moving, and as socially and politically important as anything I've read over the last 10 years. And from another reviewer, particularly poignant are the stories that highlight the complex interrelationship between the mind and body and how our feelings and those of our patients dramatically affect medical outcomes. So to call, um, assist me in welcoming Dr. Eric Nett. training at King's County Hospital. Um, and then I um, went to spend uh, a number of years up in uh, Dartmouth Medical School. Met my wife there. So a Mexican uh, uh, woman, a professor at NYU. And then we moved back to New York uh, about 16 years ago. I took this position at, at Bellevue. And um, the New York City public hospital system, just to orient you, is the largest public hospital system in the country. It's huge. Um, we have 11 hospitals. There's a 100 plus clinics all around the city. Some of you, I'm sure, have gone to the, the city hospital system. Um, Bellevue is sort of the center piece of the system. It also has a lot of nursing homes that provides a lot of uh, services. Its, its total budget is about almost $8 billion a year. It has 40,000 employees. It has 5,000 doctors. And if we take care of about, we have 5 million visits a year. So it's a big, busy uh, operation. One of the things that struck me about Bellevue was that it's, um, because New York is such an international cosmopolitan city, working there is like, it's like getting a glimpse into what's going on around the world. And um, uh, I, I almost call it like the patients that come there are like canaries in the coal mine. In other words, we'll get patients from different parts of the world, whether it's Tibet, from different parts of the Middle East, from different parts of Africa, all throughout Latin America and Asia, when there's something brewing, some crisis is going on, and it's before it's reported in the news, it's before it's on, on CNN or MSNBC or anything like that, Fox News, and before it's in the newspapers. So Bellevue is sort of like a filter for the city. But let me tell you what's different about Bellevue than any of the other 75 hospitals in New York. It takes care of patients, 
regardless of their ability to pay. So we will take care of anybody that walks through the doors of Bellevue, comes into our emergency room, gets taken care of, and if they can't afford it, they, get, they don't get any charge. I started there in 1997. I'll tell you, the first day I was at work, we got a guy transferred to us in a taxi cab from a hospital in New Jersey. He was a Turkish gentleman. He had been a stowaway on a boat and ended up in New Jersey. He got a fever. He had chills. He was sweating profusely. And he had little red spots on his hands. And he went into one of their emergency rooms. He was shaking from his fever. And they took one look at him and they said, oh my god. They put him in a cab and they sent him to Bellevue Hospital. It turns out that he had an infection in his heart valve and it was sending off little blood clots throughout his system. It's called endocarditis. If they had kept him in their hospital, it would have cost them $100,000 to $200,000. We kept him in our hospital for almost three months, put in a new heart valve, and the total bill came to $175,000. And there was no, no charge. So it's a very complicated um, system. We take care of anybody that comes through. I mean, they get, in general, very, very high quality uh, medical care. All of the hospitals, all 11, are affiliated with some of the best medical schools in New York. So the faculty are generally quite outstanding. So let's, let's jump in um, so I can talk to you a little bit about 12 Patients, which is this book that I wrote um, two years ago. It came out last year. The, what happened to me over the course of 15 years, I'll tell you a little story. I was, um, my first day at work at Bellevue in 1997, I'd already been a doctor for 20 years, had a lot of experience. I had, I had gone through like a midlife crisis and I took two years off and I spent one year at, in Haiti working at the hospital in Schweitzer. It's in the Central Valley, our Kibonite Valley in, in uh, a town called De Chapelle. It was an amazing experience for me, really transformative who I was as a person and what I, could, what I could do with practically no resources, providing outstanding care for the community. Then the year after that, I got invited to work at, in Karachi, Pakistan, at the hospital, the Aga Khan Medical Center. And I got set up to an area now which is controlled by the Taliban in uh, the Swat Valley. It's near the Afghani border and uh, China. I spent a year there uh, providing women's health. Very, very interesting experience. So those two years were really critical in my maturing as a physician and as a, as a person. The other thing that matured me is my wife um, is a Mexican. Um, and we met when she was finishing her PhD. And we have very strong ties to Latin America. She's a Latin American scholar. And we spent a lot of time in Latin America. She's from Mexico City and spent a lot of time in Guatemala, Mexico, Argentina. Um, a couple of the other countries. So I've had this sort of international view. So one of the fun things about being at Bellevue, Bellevue's a few blocks south of the UN on the East River, but it's like an international community. The patients are from all over the world, and the staff that works there is from all over the world, principally from Latin America, but a lot of people from West Africa and international, a lot of Chinese people. So the staff, we have 5,000 staff, we have 1,000 attending physicians and 1,000 doctors and training. So it's a real city in itself. So what are the, what are the key issues that I, I want to just lead into? And, and I want to talk about some of these issues relating to the patients that I wrote about. So the first day I got to work, I was, uh, I decided, I got there in July, 1997, and I decided I wanted to um, start work on the wards taking care of patients, supervising the residents and the interns. But that would be the best way for me to get a feel for what's going on in a hospital, instead of just sitting in the office and going to some meetings. So what happened was we were, the house staff were taking me around and presenting a case to me, and the first patient they presented to me was a homeless cop, about 44 years old. He had tuberculosis, he had a big liver, he had a lot of abnormalities on his, on his lab tests. And I was sitting next to him on a plastic chair. And I knew, I knew what his medical problems were. They, were. they were interesting and they were complicated to treat, but they were pretty straightforward. But I took a look at his armband, and on his little armband that had his name on it, it had a name that I recognized. And I asked the guy, I said, sir, are you from uh, Trinidad? And he said, yeah. Jeez, how, how do you know I'm from Trinidad? 
from Port of Spain, Trinidad. And then I said to him, uh, you're not related to B.S. Naipaul. His name was Naipaul. B.S. Naipaul is a writer who won the Nobel Prize about 18 years ago, who currently lives in London, and he's from Trinidad. Part of this movement of Indians who left India to work in the Caribbean, and a um, huge amount of uh, Trinidadians are from India, and then they, a lot of them migrated north. It turns out he was his cousin. So this guy was a homeless guy, nameless homeless guy, with all these kind of problems you associate, say, with vagrancy and poverty, was laying on the bed. And then it occurred to me that, you know, this was a very special place where I was working. These were real people with complicated stories, and they weren't just no-name people lying in bed. So what I did the next day is I bought, you know those little black speckled notebooks you have when you're in grade school? So I bought myself a dozen of those, package of a dozen, and I started carrying them around with me for the next 15 years at the hospital. And I filled a hundred of them with all the stories and the interesting things that I saw. Like an anthropologist, I was writing around like, if I was at a meeting with all you guys, I'd sit there and I'd say, gee, Anthony mentioned that about that. I talked to you guys and told me something interesting that happened to your mom or your, your brother or your sister. I'm talking about the medical and the social stuff around it. And I filled up a hundred notebooks. And then four years ago, I decided I wanted to write about the complicated political social and economic issues confronting the United States, the stuff that you guys are studying, the stuff that you guys want to engage in when you graduate. Gun violence, immigration, women's issues, mass incarceration, all the stuff. And what I had was I collected about 250 stories, very particular stories of patients from all around the world. And I'm not talking about superficial, very detailed stories. I got to know the patients. I got to know their wives, their husbands, their sisters, their mothers. I got to know them extensive interviews and talks. In several of the patients, I went back to their native countries where they came from. And I'll tell you about some of those. There were such important linkages to make. I wanted to complete the whole story. You know, I've been a doctor for many years by this point, almost 20 years. And the doctor's experience in his office, let's say any one of you came in to see me for a, a visit, check up, or you had some complaint. Say I have a half an hour. I don't get to know you, you don't get to know me, and it's a little superficial transaction. Hopefully enough occurs there so that the right thing gets done. But it's very transient. So this was an opportunity to get to know people in a much deeper way, who came from the most extraordinary experiences. And I'm going to share some of those with you. So there were, there were three questions that, that just led me, and I'm going to go into some of the stories, led me into this conversation, aside from meeting this guy and carrying around these notebooks. And it had to do with the nature of being a doctor. And I think you guys are reading about now all the controversies surrounding Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, health care expenses, people not being insured, the amount of co-pays, the amount of bankruptcies associated with health care. It's pretty extraordinary in a society like this that we have an enormous amount of problems with people getting the right, the right health care. In spite of the fact that we have this gigantic, absolutely humongous health care delivery system. I just want to draw one parallel. We have this huge, we have this gigantic, we have this incredibly expensive criminal justice system. So what I'm going to say now, I want you to think health care, and I'd also like you to think criminal justice. There's a huge overlap, and there's a huge parallel between the systems. So the first question is, does health care equal health? In other words, we've associated in this country health care is health. You get healthy. I want you to think about that. And translate that just in the criminal justice environment. Does a criminal justice system equal safety in communities? The second question, which is really a part of being a, a, a true American, is part of our national way of thinking, is more better. I think 
the United States, we always think is more is better. A little is good, more is better. So for healthcare, is more better. Is more hospitals, more CAT scans, more doctors, more of everything improve healthcare? Or in fact, have we reached the upper limit, but it's just poorly distributed amongst people who need it? We translate it to criminal justice. Is more better. If we, have, if we build more prisons, if we add more policemen, if we have more judges, if we take the existing system and just dose it twice, three times, four times as much, instead of costing $75 billion, we'll spend a half a trillion, will that make us safer? Will that make it better? And the flip side, just in parenthesis, is just a thought. Maybe there are side effects from the system itself that causes its own problem. So the third comment I just want to make, and this, this sort of triggered my thinking about these things many, many years ago. If you go down to Worth Street, right near the um, where the mayor's office is on Worth Street, near JNR and Park Road, downtown Manhattan, there's a big squat building. It's right near um, the tombs that had detention center and the courts. And it's where the public hospital system's headquarters are. It's where the Department of Health used to be headquartered. Now they moved out to Long Island City. But there's a guy's name there. His name was Herman Bakes. His name was carved into the side of the building. And Herman Bakes was Commissioner of Health in New York 100 years ago. Probably the most important Commissioner of Health in the United States. 100 years ago, he was Commissioner of Health in New York Average age was 45, people died. Tuberculosis rampant around the city. Diphtheria, all the kids were dying of diphtheria. He essentially eliminated tuberculosis as an epidemic by having nurses go to people's homes. This is way before medicines for tuberculosis were discovered after World War II. Way before. But they really turned tuberculosis from being a lethal disease in, in the 19 teams, not World War I. And the other thing is he invented the diphtheria vaccine and eliminated diphtheria from infecting the kids and dying from diphtheria. But he asked a question. And he made a comment about his observations over 25 years as Commissioner of Health. And this is really important, and I think it's relevant to criminal justice also. He said a society can determine its own death rate. Just want you to sit with that. We'll get back to that. Society can determine its own death rate. So what I'd like to do is to just take you on a little walk with me through some of the patients I saw, just to illustrate some of the issues that came up. Like I said, I had over 200 patients that I got into a lot of detail. I selected these 12 because they illustrated particular <coughs> social, political, and economic issues that I felt were really, really important. And I thought the best way to sort of get the word out was to tell the patient's own story. I love stories. I learn things from stories. In medical school, you could sit me in front of a book, and I, I read it 100 times, and we were remember anything. I saw one patient with a medical problem, I never forgot. I learned everything. Training at Kings County, we used to have a book. We called it the admission book. You'd go in every morning with this big fat book, and everybody would write down any interesting case that was in the hospital the night before. So we'd all run around and see those cases. I saw everything, 10 years. It was fantastic. So let me tell you about this first patient. Her name was Julia. And the name of the chapter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some hints of you know, half a dozen chapters. The name of the chapter is called The Heart for Rabinal. Rabinal is a town in northern Guatemala. <clears throat> it's about a six hour drive from the Mexican border. It's in a state called Baja Verabas. And it's about an eight hour drive from Guatemala City. So I got a call one day from one of my friends, a guy I had trained with in Kings County many years earlier. He called me up and said, Er, I got this lady. She's got a really bad heart. You know, your heart's about as big as a fist. 
Her heart was what we call a wall-to-wall -wall heart, one to each side of her chest. It was gigantic. It was this big. And usually when a heart squeezes, it squeezes about 65% of the blood out that's in it. Her heart was going like this. It only squeezed 8% out. She was 42 years old. And he called me up. He said, Eric, we got this lady, Julia. And she's from Guatemala. She's undocumented. And she's got some weird heart disease. We have no idea what's going on. But could we transfer her to Bellevue? This hospital was in Brooklyn, and it was a, a good community hospital, but they didn't have the capability of taking care of a lady this sick. So I said, yes, send her over, you know, absolutely. I let our cardiologist know, and I completely forgot about the case. The stuff was coming in all the time, all kinds of stuff, a lot of income. And uh, about three weeks later, a month later, I get a call from one of the cardiologists said, hey, Eric, could you um, meet me for a cup of coffee in the coffee shop? I want to talk to you about that patient that came in from Woodhall. Said, I had no recollection of the patient. I didn't know what he was talking about. I pretended I did. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about her. Let's. And um, go down, I bought him a cup of coffee. We had, I call it the uh, corrections officer special. Eight eggs over easy, sausages, bacon, um, home fries, eight pieces of bread. You know what I mean? The, the tight little vegan breakfast we had there. So, um, he says to me, you got this lady, she's, uh, she happens to be from Guatemala, she's got a wall-to-wall -wall heart. And uh, we figured out her diagnosis, but there's not much we can treat her with. I said, well, you know, what's her diagnosis? She said, well, she's got Chagas disease. I don't know if you guys have heard of Chagas disease. Chagas disease is, it's named after a guy named Char Carlos Chagas, who was a Brazilian physician. And he was fighting malaria in, uh, outside of um, Sao Paulo in uh, about 1925. There was a lot of malaria in, in um, Brazil at that time. And he discovered another disease that looked almost like malaria, the, the, the germ in the, under the microscope, but it was a different one. And he identified it, and it was ultimately named Chagas disease. It's, Chagas disease occurs from southern Mexico to, uh, to Brazil. And it's called the kissing disease. What happens is there's a bug, a reduvid bug, that lives in the roof of poor people's houses, thatched roofs. And at night, it drops down for a blood meal. And it likes, it likes warm skin because there's a lot of blood flow. So it goes near the mouth, and it bites somebody near the mouth. And it leaves a little red mark, a little kiss. That's why they call it the kissing disease. And it injects these germs called trypanosomes into the system of the individual. People might get a fever for a day or two, feel like the flu, and 20 years later, it goes, it's been in the heart, it causes millions of little scars, and the heart, which goes from this side, goes wall to wall. End stage heart failure. Very common throughout Latin America. Chagas disease. Nothing we could do, if we had gotten it earlier, we could have treated it early, meaning within the first year. Once it's gone, it goes silent until somebody gets shortness of breath. And this woman had profound shortness of breath. So the issue was a couple of issues I want to talk about. One is, what was this lady? I got to know her very well. I got to know her and her sister. She had shown up in New York City six years earlier. She'd been living in Baja Vera Paz. And Baja Vera Paz, as I mentioned, was south of Mexico. So you know Mexico's been pretty much there's been a huge amount of gangs and uh, narco trafficking. It's extended way over the border into northern Guatemala. This part of Guatemala has been controlled by the narco gangs for some time. She came home one day and she found her husband's hands on her front door. He'd been kidnapped, tortured. He had borrowed some money from some of the narco guys, hadn't been able to repay it. So she got repaid with his hands body was never recovered. So she and 15 other people paid a coyote, a human trafficker, in, uh, in that part of Rabina, which is the town she's from, to take her to Chapa, Tapachula, which is on the, in Chiapas at the Mexican border. It cost $3,000. She borrowed from a lot of friends to take her to Tapachula to hand her over to another human trafficker who would then take her to Brownsville, Texas. So, well, managed to get up to Tapachula, 
Tapachula is the center of Central American human trafficking up through Mexico. The problem is, she didn't read the small print in the contract. You guys know what's going on in Mexico? You hear, any of you guys heard of Las Maras Salvatrucha? Yeah. So Las Maras are the worst, most deadly gang in the Americas. Las Maras, Salvatrucha, Maris is a kind of a swarming ant. Salvatrucha comes from El Salvador. These were El Salvadorian kids whose parents had escaped the civil war in El Salvador and ended up in LA. And to survive the fights between the Chicanos and the Mexicanos and the this and the that and the other thing, they formed gangs. And these guys are called MS-13. If you Google MS-13, you can see they're very heavily tattooed, even on the front of their face, with MS-13. Mara Salvatrucha 13 was the Calle 13. So Osmaras had taken over the human trafficking route in Chiapas. So she was captured by Osmaras and she was sexually traded and had to sell herself for two months to pay them back because she had no money. She would pay the trafficker from Guatemala. She eventually survived and got dumped in uh, Brownsville, made her way to Brooklyn. She got a job in a um, and they laundry, all night laundry, doing uh, pressing and things like that. And then she got progressively short of breath. And then she ended up at a hospital, and then she got transferred to, to us. So when I got to see her, we would have spent a lot of time going through the story of her life and how she got there and all the issues that were going on in Guatemala. I actually went down to Rabinal to visit the area, and some of her, her parents were still there and some other people have got a sense of that community. But the issue then was what, what had happened in Guatemala. I don't know if you're aware, but the current, in, Ma, in Guatemala right now, there's a um, uh, we seal, it's called, a, a, a trial against a former president of Guatemala who was guilty of killing 250,000 Mayans in the highlands. This, this is part of the highlands of Guatemala. His name is Rios Montt. This was part of the Cold War U.S. politics in Latin America. He was trained in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, at the School of the Americas. Uh, also, he was trained in Spain under Franco and ended up uh, running the country as the head general and then uh, president of the country. He's 85 years now. He's, being, um, he's on the uh, stand. He's being held for uh, genocide, crimes against humanity. So the issue was the political issue, the geopolitical issues, the economic issues, the human trafficking issues, Chagas disease, a woman with a heart that wasn't functioning, was 42 years old, by the way, she had two kids, and what could we do? And the only thing, I said to the guy, I was talking to the cardiologist, I said, she's got this terrible problem, but you know, I'm an internist now, I, I can't really help you. What, what do you want me to do? And he leaned over that big plate of sausages and bacon. And he said, uh, you got to get her a heart transplant. So this story is about getting, it's called a heart for Ravinov. It was getting her a heart transplant. Now, if you know your history and your law, you can't get a transplant if you're not documented. You need to be on Medicaid. And Medicaid will pay for it. A heart costs five hundred thousand dollars at Columbia University, which says the the best heart transplants in the city, the highest volume. No way I could uh, get her a heart. At any rate, you got to get the book, see what happened. <laughs> Shameless promotion. Apologize. <laughs> I'll tell you this: she did get the heart. I won't tell you how she got the heart. The secret of my 15 years, I don't know what your guys' motto was, I never asked for permission, I only asked for forgiveness. That's how she got going. I'm not telling you that's what you should do. <laughs> um, let me switch gears here. So people associate Bellevue with um, the destitute, the tough, you can't, you know, this kind of woman who ends up on the streets in New York. If you've watched too much Law and Order or Nurse Jackie or any of the shows, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. By the way, they all filmed there. I've met all these actresses and actors and stuff like that. It gets, and everybody comes up to me and says, oh, Eric, you know, it's a crazy house, isn't it? Blah, blah, blah. 
all my friends should be hospitalized there too. So I don't know, you know who's, who's crazy and who's not, but it does have 350 psych beds, the biggest psych hospital in the country in addition to everything else within the hospital. But as you guys know from your studies, the biggest psych hospital in the United States is the prison system of the United States, right? After deinstitutionalization in the 60s under Kennedy, the psych beds in the country were shut down. New York State alone had 66,000 psych beds, long-term psych beds, and now it's less than 6,000. Now, where did the people go when an ambulatory care, good outpatient mental health system was promised but never delivered? By the way, it was never delivered because of the cost of the Vietnam War, which completely bankrupted the United States. They ended up on the streets, and then they ended up in prison. So the prison, it's interesting though, the biggest provider of long-term mental health uh, habitation, I wouldn't say there's treatment, is the uh, prison system of the United States. So let me talk to you, just to, just to switch gears here a little bit. So we're in the hospital one day, I got a call, I was actually at a, at a function downtown. Um, and they said, Eric, we got this guy. He's one of these. And they mentioned his name. I said, oh, my God, what's he doing at the hospital? He said, he's having a heart attack. I said, OK. So this guy was a hedge fund um, multi-billionaire. He's taking his limo north to go to a meeting. And he gets chest discomfort outside, about a couple blocks from Bellevue. He tells the chauffeur, take me to the nearest hospital. The guy screeches, makes a right turn, shoots over to First Avenue at 27th Street, goes around the back into the uh, uh, ambulance slot, and uh, we card the guy in, and he, they start working on him. Look at his EKG, he's having a, a heart attack. The bottom part of his heart, the wall that sits on his diaphragm, was, uh, was, was having, not getting enough oxygen. They called me up, they said, this guy is there, so I said, okay, I'll leave the function. I came up, and uh, it, it turned out it wasn't going to be a real serious MI, so we could, uh, it's called an inferior wall MI, those generally people do okay. So we were, we were cool. But I was a little worried because this guy was very well known around the city, very well known around the country, and, um, and uh, you know, but there might be some repercussions from that. At any rate, the next day, he, um, he's getting better from his heart attack. <clears throat> he starts hallucinating. He becomes psychotic. He became psychotic for the next two months. Absolutely schizophrenic psychotic. This is a guy who never was psychotic before or anything else. He said, oh my god, what's going on with this guy? And in fact, then his heart attack got a little worse. We had to put him in the intensive care unit. We had to sedate him, essentially put him under general anesthesia. He was in a coma. We lifted up the coma. He was calmer, but he was still hallucinating like crazy. So eventually, we transferred him to the unit in the hospital we called the double trouble unit. So. The double trouble unit is if you're addicted and you have serious and persistent mental illness. We did a tox screen on his urine and it came back positive for everything. Everything. And that you're a toxicologist, so everything is everything, okay? He had crystal meth. He had marijuana. He had alcohol. He had Ativan. He had Klonopin. He had you name it, he had it. It turns out that he'd been an addict for years. You know, the number one cause of addiction now is drugs you find in the cabinet. It's not cocaine and heroin. It's stuff you buy from your friends that's in your grandmother's cabinet. It's just the little bottles that are sitting there, right? More deaths, overdose deaths from that with alcohol than anything. So this guy had been addicted to all kinds of drugs and feigned a zillion different illnesses and had a dozen different doctors around Manhattan that he, he had on his secretary thing. So oh, I've got a meeting with Dr. Blah, 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 blah. Got a meeting with so and so. And he'd go to see these different doctors, tell him he had a kidney stone, another one he had this kind of problems, arthritis. And he kept getting prescriptions from a ready, willing, and able medical profession. In fact, <clears throat> he bought his marijuana from a uh, graduate student in physics at New York University who had a Vespa scooter and would, to make extra money, would deliver marijuana to people and then go and study his plasma physics. He gave him a special cigarette, which was late, marijuana cigarette, which was laced with PCP. And the 
guy lost it, and that's when he became psychotic. So the story here was about the U.S. consumption of drugs, the addiction of this country to all kinds of drugs, licit and illicit drugs, the drug war, which I'm all familiar with, I'm not going to lecture you guys on the, on the drug situation and the drug war, but it's been going on for a really long time and it's had a huge amount of collateral damage. But this guy is, is, is Mr. Uh, clean, he's an upright citizen, and he is a, uh, a, a very serious drug addict. So what he proceeded to do was to destroy himself, his job, his wife, his children, and what happened, I got involved with him again. He, I got an email four years later, and he invited me to hear him at a qualification. You guys, anybody here know what a qualification is? You've heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? A. Well, every year you're in AA, you get a coin. It says year one, year two, you get a coin every year. When you get your coin, pretend this is an AA meeting, okay? You guys are all... Congratulations. <laughs> and so he was coming up for his fourth year qualification. So he'd been good. He'd been clean for four years. And he was getting a, a coin. And when you when you go through your qualification, you make a talk to the AA group. It's called the qualification. And you tell them what's going on, how your life is. And I got an email, a very cryptic email. He invited me to go to hear his AA meeting, which is very unusual. I've been to a bunch of AA meetings for different patients for a variety of different things because it's a common problem with drug addiction and alcohol addiction. So there's AAs for everything, and AAs for family members of addicted, etc. And I went to hear his qualifications. So I sat in the back. I tried to be unobtrusive. There are a lot of personal things spoken at AA meetings, and you really want to be respectful. It was a 105-degree night, humid. The air was so thick. Southern Manhattan, and he got up there, he didn't look at me, I didn't look at him, and I listened to him talk for half an hour. And what he said and what I knew about him were two different things. The person he was now and the life he talked about was completely different than the guy I knew four years ago. And afterwards I walked out and I got myself a beer and a little place, quiet, just needed to chill out there, about an AC, because it was really hot. And I just thought about, what does it mean to blow up your life and to recreate something? First I was angry at him, I thought he was lying, and he made up this, and then I rethought about it many times, and he had put something together. He had put his life back in some fashion. He made up a story, or some, some put something together. I was thinking about the nature of redemption. Was, we've all done stuff. All things have kind of happened to us or family members. Let me tell you about a patient. I call him, how many of you are from the Dominican Republic here? Oh, no, no, man. Ah, 